really. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Lyons, how are you? Alive and well. That's a good thing. All right. Sorry about that. Just trying to get this. That didn't work. <clears throat> yeah. There we go. Much better. Mr. Herman, Mr. Owens, how are you? Doing good, George. Third time for John. Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. I thought they didn't have audio. <laughs> Hi, James. Hi, everyone. Sorry. So, Elena, you're good. Hey, Clifford. Hey, John. Hi, John. Welcome. Hey, George. George. Charla, Charla, we hear you're parenting. You're busy, a busy mom. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not muted. My apologies. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, that is. <laughs> Only person who has three kids running around. <laughs> okay, do we have a corn? We have one, two, three, four. We do have a corn. How's it going, Harry? Hi, everybody. How's it going, Harry? There's Melinda. Good to go. Uh. <clears throat> Oh, 
Um, uh, Lane, uh, is your mic? No, okay. Uh, do you wanna try logging out and logging back in? Okay. Okay, do you want me to start? Okay. All right, everybody, it is 7.03 and we are going to go ahead and get started. So we will start by uh, taking the roll. Um, Tom Lang, I know your audio is not working, but I see it. Uh, Tom Owens. Here. Jim Herman. Here. Dr. McLean. Here. Joe Sarah Pacillo. Joe. Mickey Norris. George is here. I am. Um, Miss Shirley says she will call in, but I don't see her. And Emily Whelan. Okay. We do have a quorum. And the first, we will get right into the agenda. Um, welcome everyone to the- Can you hear me Ready? now? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Okay, well, you can uh, roll right over into, into running the meeting. All right. Uh, thank you, James, and sorry, everybody. So welcome to the uh, February 10th, uh, 2021 SMAC meeting. And uh, James has already called the roll. So thanks to everybody on the, uh, on the um, committee and, and uh, in the audience who's attending, as well as our speakers. So our first... Uh, order of business is election of officers. And James, why don't you give us the rundown on how that happens? Good to go. So anyone that is interested in serving as the chair or vice chair, um, I've been the de facto secretary, but anyone that's interested in chair or vice chair, you can nominate yourself or nominate someone else. And um, that's how we'll proceed with the election of officers. So is there anyone interested in being the chair? Any of the council members? I see George Cleveland's hand up. I, I'm not actually, oh. I want to nominate somebody. I don't want it. I've done it before. Okay. No. So can I nominate Tom Lang to be the chair? Yes, you can. Okay, I nominate Tom I'll, Lang to be the chair. I'll second that. <laughs> Are there any other nominations outside of Tom Lang? All right, it looks like um, uh, we will need to take a roll. So I will begin with George, um, George Cleveland, yes or no? Yes. Tom Owens? Yes. Dr. McLean? Yes. Um, I, did I see Miss Shirley? No, you need to go to Jim. Yeah, um, I saw Miss Shirley pop up and uh, then she disappeared. Um, Jim Herman? No, Miss Shirley's still there. Okay. Hi, Miss Shirley. We can't hear. Yes, on uh, me. I'm sorry. I was muted there for a minute, James. Oh, no problem, sir. Okay, Miss Shirley, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. So, Miss Shirley, can you give me a thumbs up if you support Tom Lang being the? Okay. So, Tom Lang is the chair. Um, we will now take nominations for vice chair. Um. Mr. Mr. Lyons, if, if you would be so kind as to ask Mr. Lang if he wants to be the chair. Oh, I didn't ask. Yes, I'm happy to continue. <laughs> Look, thank you, George. <laughs> now I'd like to thank you, everybody. I'd like to nominate Tom Owens to be the vice chair. Okay. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? I see none. I will take the roll. Um, on Tom Owens being vice chair, uh, George Cleveland? Yes. Jim Herman? Yes. Miss Shirley? Give me a thumbs up or down. Okay. <laughs> Dr. McLean? Yes. And Tom Owens, are you okay with being the vice chair again? Yes. All right, good. And job. I'm, I'm, Tom. I'm happy with Tom as the vice chair as well. Copy that. Yes, so we. We have uh, our chair and vice chair. Uh, congratulations, gents. And I will turn the meeting back over to Tom Lang. 
um, for approval of the January minutes. Okay. Um, can we have a motion to approve the uh, January the minutes for January uh, 2021? So moved. Um, I'm, and I second. Okay. So all let's say uh, we'll all go roll, roll call. Uh, George. Yes. Melinda. Yes. Jim. Yes. Tom. Yes. I also vote to approve uh, Miss Shirley. We can't hear you, Miss Shirley. Miss Shirley, you can email me and I'll, I'll, I'll get my. She's, you got she's thumbs, got okay. thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Minutes approved. Okay, minutes are approved. Can we go to the treasurer's report? $3,000. $3,000, thank you, James. So we have a number of presentations by, uh, by uh, Supervisor Joya, Joya, Lieutenant Buford, uh, Chief Thomas, uh, Officer Leviste, as well as a presentation by Sophia Skoda from the East Bay uh, Municipal Utility District. And uh, so why don't we start off with uh, Supervisor Joya's uh, county update. Any uh, questions or discussions after his presentation, limited to uh, a minute each. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I um, can't be- John, real quick, this is, yeah. meeting is being recorded. I apologize for not saying that sooner. I wanted to give everybody a heads up. We are recording the meeting. Excuse me, Supervisor Joy. So whatever you say can be used against you. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the moral of that story, right? <laughs> um, thanks, Tom. I can't stay with you for the whole meeting, but I wanted to- sort of give a county report, including uh, things that our health officer would say in a report. So um, uh, at, at uh, our recent Board of Supervisors meeting, uh, we uh, did a couple of things. Uh, we extended the countywide rent freeze and rent um, eviction moratorium through the end of June. The state has a similar moratorium, assuming you pay a certain portion of your rent. Um, and let me, let me, I'll talk about that briefly. Our, our um, moratorium goes, uh, it has more protections. Um, that's my cat you hear in the background. If I let him out of my bedroom, he'll come and prevent me from giving my talk here. So <laughs> he's, he's in my bedroom next door. Um, so, um, um, we also, our moratorium also includes through March, uh, a um, moratorium on commercial for small businesses as well. We're trying to protect small businesses and, and, and is a countywide rent free, something that's not in the state law. The other thing we've done is um, we uh, approved, uh, we're developing a program for uh, rent relief um, for, and it actually, the money goes to the landlord, so it pays rent off. And uh, the county is receiving, uh, we're receiving about $70 million from federal and state government. And we opted to, the state has a program. So we opted to use the 35 million we were getting from the federal government and roll that into the state's program of 35 million. And then we are going to spend um, a fair amount of money to do community outreach with various community-based organizations to really try to help lower income residents. So you'll hear more about this. Um, so it's really meant to be rent relief, um, uh, rental assistance, I should say, because there's a lot of unpaid rent that is owing. So between federal and state government, we this is the first time we've gotten a larger sum to, to help um, and it, so it helps landlords as well as um, tenants. Um, there's more information about that on the county's website. We also approved a countywide law. These are again, emergency laws um, that restrict uh, third party delivery services to charge on the restaurant only 15% of the order. What was happening is DoorDash and Grubhub were sometimes charging these fees, which really hurt small restaurants to keep small restaurants in, 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 uh, in business. You know they need to do deliveries, but if the if they're being charged uh, these high unreasonable amounts by Grubhub and DoorDash, 
it's out of, it comes out of the restaurant's pocket. So our uh, ordinance limits what they could charge. So on a delivery, it limits them to 15% of the order. Um, and that is in effect, um, I think it's through June or July and we revisit it depending on the pandemic. So that provides some protection for, um, for local uh, residents. Um, and, uh, oh, I, I will, um, I just was reading a message from our, our sanitary director, I call him director Harry. So I, I do want to acknowledge that Harry's on, uh, from, um, from the West County wastewater district. Um, so the, the other items which have a lot of interest are the, um, you know, is the vaccine rollout. So, um, the county is um, vaccinating um, the public for free. However, it is still encouraged that you go to your healthcare provider first. Half the vaccinations occurring in the county are by the county. The other half are occurring by providers like Kaiser, Sutter, John Muir. Um, <clears throat> and um, so it is recommended that you first go through your provider, if you have Kaiser, to go through them. <clears throat> And um, um, although anyone can come to the county as well. Um, and I've, I've really been advocating for an equitable rollout. Um, what's happening uh, across this country, across this state and in the Bay Area is um, we're generally seeing, and Contra Costa is not unique to this, we're seeing um, you know, higher income white communities have a higher percentage of people vaccinated than uh, lower income communities of color. Uh, that's beginning to change. Um, and um, actually it's interesting, El Sobrante is doing relatively well. Um, right now, a little under 16% of the county of people over 16 have received their first dose. Um, just to give you a perspective in um, pulling up the number in El Sobrante, that number is actually 21%. So El Sobrante is doing better than the county average. Um, it's about 22% of residents in El Sobrante have their first dose. To give you a perspective, Richmond is at only 9%. Um, communities like, um, well, what's El Cerrito? El Cerrito is at uh, about 17.6. Danville's at 22. The highest, I think, Walnut Creek's at 26. Um, so there is a gap, and one of the things I really strongly advocated for, and the county has started, is a mobile vaccination effort. So the county's identified low-income senior housing projects around the county, and we're going out and vaccinating um, seniors and at those, and we started that in North Richmond last Friday, and I think 61 seniors were vaccinated. Um, there are three high-volume vaccination centers in West right in the Richmond San Pablo area. There's Contra Costa College. Um, there's uh, the county's health center in San Pablo. And then there's the Richmond Auditorium, all three operated by the county. There's fire agencies with a pop-up mass vaccination clinic in Hercules. So um, um, I am continuing to really keep an eye on those, on those equity numbers. Um, Boy, without my reading glasses, it's harder to read these um, chats, but uh, these messages, but I'll, I'll look at those in the chat. Um, and uh, so I really, the other, the other thing that's important to note is we're not getting enough vaccine um, to really try to meet the goals we need to. Um, we have capacity to administer more vaccine than the amount we're getting from the state. And that's often because the state's not getting enough from the federal government. Um, and um, yes, I think a note here, people at La Walnut Creek probably has a high number skewed because of Rossmore. That's probably true. Um, so one of the, th the other problem is that the state is changing its criteria. So here's where we're at in terms of priority right now. The first tier was vaccinating healthcare workers and residents of congregate care facilities. And that's gone on, still going on, you know, probably almost done, but continues. Then the state uh, basically said the next tier are people 65 and older. 
Um, so the county is accepting appointments for those. We're still trying to prioritize people 75 or older, but if you're 65 or older, you can. Uh, your provider may or may not, depending what they're doing. I think Kaiser may now be doing 65 or older. They weren't before. Uh, so the county is. Um, and then the state announced that it was going to scrap its very complicated tiering system, that it would be too complex and take too much time in favor of an age-based system, except it would keep three more tiers, three more priorities. Um, food and agriculture workers, emergency service workers, and educators, teachers, school support staff, you know, that includes, you know, food service workers, bus drivers, all of that. Um, we're not getting enough vaccine to do all of those at once, although the governor's going to come out and issue some guidance soon. And um, um, hopefully that will be, um, that will be um, clearer. Someone says here, actually, John, uh, people at Rasmus are not getting vaccinated, huh? Okay, and having trouble getting appointments. Wow, so well, this comment about people at Rossmore having problems um, uh, depends where they're going. I, uh, so I know the county is trying to prioritize people 75 um, and older. And uh, John, these yeah. are 90 year olds. Yeah. These are 90 year olds with adult children trying to get an appointment for them anywhere. And they, right. so it concerns me that, yeah. that, you know, they're expanding all these categories and we haven't hit the most vulnerable people yet. Yeah. We're not getting them. And um, so so I, call me tomorrow. We can, we, you know, yeah, directly, we, can how we can help folks. I mean, if, if they should be getting it from their provider or the county, and I know um, that um, the county does have a, um, a phone number system and an online system where people can make appointments. And I'm hearing now that folks over 75 are getting prioritized and are getting appointments within two weeks. So um, yeah, follow up. So Melinda, think, call me tomorrow. We 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 can work on that. My myself you know, and my coworker Kate, we'll figure what's it out. Happening with Kaiser and and all of those, and how quickly, even though they're opening appointments, but I I know what the county's doing, and you sort of the state is setting the guidelines, and um, the our county, most Bay Area counties, are focusing now on sixty five or older. Um. Alameda in San Francisco, Alameda has started to uh, vaccinate educators um, uh, and be, in order to try to get, you know, schools open, other counties have not. They've, they're waiting till they get more vaccine. So what's happened under the governor's proposal is counties are rolling it out in different ways. And so it's not been uniform. So San Francisco says it's gonna open it up to educators this month, Alameda has but the other barrier counties are still focusing on 65 and older. So there's some different rollouts happening. And, um, and then there's this, this new state system called My Turn that we'll see whether all counties enroll in that, um, which is a state app. And then the state selected Blue Shield to be a third party administrator to to, to basically allocate the vaccines among counties. And we're a little concerned about what that means and whether equity will be part of that. So there's some concerns in having Blue Shield do this. Um, state believes they'll do a better job than the state. So, you know, um, that's, um, that's what's happening there. So um, testing still is going on. Um, um, so it's still recommended to get tested um, when you need that, when you need to. And even if you get vaccinated, you know, you're still, uh, you still need to wear a mask when you're out and about and social distance. Um, and um, uh, the estimates I've seen that given the current vaccine supply, it could take until May to vaccinate everyone 65 and older. And then what would most likely happen is then um, the next age group will be, we'll see what the state establishes, whether it's 40 to 64, 50 to 64, I think it may be 50 to 64, but the state is continually changing, but so they'll continually get to younger folks. One thing they're considering doing is creating priority for people with 
who are vulnerable uh, medically. So right now, for example, if you're 55 and you had a heart transplant or you have cancer and you have higher risk, you don't get a priority under the state's guidelines. There's been a lot of discussion about that and it's possible that that category will get a priority as well. So changing guidelines from the state, but the focus in Contra Costa now is 65 and older because that's 80% of the deaths are people 65 and older. Um, so I guess I'll stop there as other things, but I think those are the topics that are of greatest interest right now. Okay. So uh, John, there are two questions. Right. Before, there are two yeah, questions so thank you very much for your presentation, John. And I'd like to start with George. He had his hand up first. And then you, Tom. Yeah. Um, well, uh, John, you said people should go to their provider. My mom, who you know, is Kaiser. Yeah. And it was impossible. They are very there and they're doing a very poor job. Yeah. So she turned to the county and put, got some, I don't know how she did it, but she got her first shot and she was went to Contra Costa College, got her first shot a couple of weeks ago and she gets the second shot next week at the Richmond Auditorium. So she's thrilled. But she had to do it, but she went through the county instead of her medical providers. So I don't know, maybe in a couple of weeks since she was dealing with Kaiser, maybe they become more efficient. But yeah. when she did it, they were just. They've been a little slow on their initiation. Um, hopefully, when they fully get going, they have a pretty large infrastructure. Um, this is, they're getting their allocations directly from the state because they're a multi county health provider, they don't get their allocations from the county. Um, they get it directly from the state. Someone asked, what if you have Blue Shield? So if you have Blue Shield, I mean, this relationship with the state is totally separate from their from being an insurance company. They are using their infrastructure of providers in their system to do allocations. So if you, whether or not you have Blue Shield as a health insurance company, I don't think that really affects, um, I mean, uh, affects anything. Um, you know, if your provider is through the Blue Shield network, you still should be going to them. I don't think you're going to get the vaccine any faster because they're the third party administrator, but we'll see. Um, Kaiser, once the county is hoping that Kaiser will work with the county and take more non Kaiser patients. So every, we'd like a situation where people can go anywhere to get their vaccine. There is a, a system being developed with pharmacies where people can go to pharmacies to get a vaccine, just like flu shots. So we're gonna see some things change. Um, the county will continue doing what it's doing, but it doesn't replace all the other providers that are out there um, to get the vaccine out. Okay. So thank you for that, John. So my question was just a concern about the, dis the discrepancy between Richmond and El Sabri El Cerrito and El Sobrante, I mean, sort of 20-ish compared to 9% yeah. is huge. And so I'm wondering what are the explanatory factors and do any of those explanatory factors apply to maybe populations govern, you know, in the area of our council? Um, now, this is a national, what we're seeing nationally are, um, Communities of color, lower income communities are getting vaccinated at a slower per, uh, rate than higher income communities. What does that do to? There's a lot of factors and I, I think it, it's the county's role to work to equalize that. Remember I said half the vaccines are being provided by providers, private providers, half by the county, approximately. And that's the so my question, you know, basic question comes down to whether to what extent is it an issue of availability versus information? I, I, I think good. It, it's complicated. It's so I think one, it's the import. There's there's more transportation obstacles for often lower income residents to get to a site. So that's why we're doing mobile vaccinations. It's outreach into Spanish speaking communities. It's, there's some trust issues in some communities. There was some polling that showed that a higher number of African-Americans and Latinx residents, um, there's some mistrust of the, of the vaccine, but that doesn't account for this, for all of that. 
so there, there's a combination of, so while we have three large mass vaccination sites in the Richmond San Pablo area, it's about reaching um, individuals, uh, reaching people. So we actually have, uh, are assembling leaders in those communities to work with our health department to, de to continue to develop strategies. Like we're working with black churches um, and, and how to have vaccination at, you know, working with the churches. So I think um, it, there's, there's issues of, of outreach, there's issues of trust, there's issues of transportation obstacles. Um, the vaccine's available. That's not the, I mean, it's, it's, it's limited, but it's available to Richmond as much as it's available to Walnut Creek. In fact, we have more vaccination sites in Richmond than in Walnut Creek. Now, there's probably a lot of people getting it from their private providers there too. Um, so um, that's why I think what we're trying to do is tilt this in a different direction by focusing more efforts. This is what I believe we should do is focus more efforts in those communities that are not getting vaccinated fast enough. Like, I don't know why El Sobrante, frankly, is, is much higher, whereas you're higher than El Cerrito. I, I don't know why that is. Um, San Pablo, which had the highest per capita number of cases of the virus um, and was you know, a large Latinx community, it's at, uh, I'm just looking at the number, you know, it's at 13.6, uh, county mm -hmm. average is around 15. So it's near the county average. And then Oakley out in Far East County is at 8.7. 8 8 Oakley is a predominantly middle-class white community, growing Latinx population. So there's some anomalies there that's in East County. So that's where some of them are, I think, explainable, some are not. Now, I think the initial numbers were definitely very different because it was just healthcare workers and um, congregate care residents. And so healthcare workers aren't spread out evenly across the county. There's probably more healthcare workers in Walnut Creek than in Richmond who live there. And then there's more senior congregate care facilities in some of those communities. So some of the numbers are skewed by that. But as we vaccinate more of the general population, we should see the numbers different, but I'm still concerned about the Richmond numbers, which is why I think we're doing a lot of outreach there. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we have any additional questions uh, from the board for Supervisor Joya? Uh, Melinda? Um, could you just give a, an update on the oil spill? Yeah, I was actually down there today. So Yesterday, um, there was uh, an oil spill uh, from the Chevron Long Wharf. It, it was petroleum products. So it's, it's a line, you know, the, the Long Wharf is a mile out from the refinery and tankers offload and unload cr crude products there. And um, uh, there's the pipes that go from the refinery out to the tankers um, carry the product. So this, one of the lines developed a hole. Uh, a hole. That, that is under investigation as to the cause. Someone asked me, is it corrosion? We don't know. That's what caused the 2012 fire was a corroded pipe that burst. Um, the hole was somewhere between a quarter inch thick, a quarter inch to a, the size of a quarter. The, the, fortunately, the line was not under pressure. It was a static line, atmospheric pressure, not not other pressure. When Chevron reported it around three o'clock, uh, it was leaking at, they reported a rate of five gallons a minute. Um, the, the leak went on for about two hours. <laughs> now, an estimate is if it went five gallons a minute for two hours, that's almost 600 gallons. Um, whether, we don't know exactly, um, it has, it stopped. Uh, there's uh, so that's been contained. There's a boom around the oil sheen. The, their cleanup is happening. It, so there was oil along the the water along the shoreline from the Richmond San Rafael Bridge over to Point uh, Point Richmond. Um, I was on a call with sort of the fishing game and those folks today. They have not yet observed any impacted wildlife. However, um, they are still evaluating the habitat. I mean, clearly the habitat may be impacted. Um, fortunately, not a lot of the oil got, uh, petroleum got on shore, some did. Still evaluating impacts on uh, aquatic life. 
um, um, you know, clearly a failure of their system. Uh, that pipe should not have leaked. Um, the county issued a health advisory yesterday for people with sensitive respiratory conditions because the odor was so strong, it could irritate your eyes, nose, and throat. So what they so the health department advised people with respiratory conditions to stay indoors, and that was lifted at nine o'clock. Um, and I actually talked with Assemblywoman Buffy Wicks last night. She said, uh, what can I do to help? I said, get a law passed that allows local agencies like the Air District and others to, ink, to, to impose higher fines and penalties. She said, I'm on it. And she, so I'm working with her on that. Um, and um, she's already been in the press talking about that. So the, uh, the fine, some of the fines that can be imposed by local agencies are not high enough, I think, to be a deterrent. I'm not saying Chevron wants this to happen. They clearly don't. But, you know, fines do act as a deterrent. And um, um, every time there's been a bill on that, that the Air District has sponsored, the industry lobbies against it, and they defeat the bill. So I think she's going to try again. And uh, maybe, hopefully, it'll get passed this time. And um, um, so uh, we'll see a report from Chevron soon, uh, an initial report. The county will require a root cause analysis that will look at what caused this. Was it a corroded pipe? Was it failure to inspect the pipe? What happened? Um, fortunately, there wasn't a lot of product in that pipeline. So it's been contained. You know, cleanups occurred, is occurring. Um, and um, Chevron, yes, pays for the full cost of the cleanup and remediation. But the harm's done in the sense that there's been impact. Thank you, Supervisor Joya. If there are no further questions, from the council, I'd like to open up the floor to members of the community who have questions. If there are no questions, then thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Supervisor Joya. And now we'll move And in. I'll just say, Harry, I'll give you a call. The director Harry wants to set up an advisory committee uh, in his district for the West County Wastewater District. So, and he represents El Sobrante. So, you know, maybe Harry will get a chance to talk about that if he wants to um, during public comment later. But uh, yes, yeah, so we'll talk, Harry. Okay, great. Thank you. So now we go into Thank the you. section. Okay. Now we go into the section of, the section of our uh, meeting uh, presentations by guest speakers from law enforcement and fire protection. And so we'll start off with uh, no Lieutenant, Lieutenant Buford from the, uh, the Sheriff's Department. Lieutenant Buford emailed me, he won't be able to attend tonight. Okay, Go so ahead. in that case, we'll move directly to um, Chief Thomas from the uh, Fire Protection Battalion. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good to see your smiling faces. Um, this will be a short report from Chief Bouchard. I uh, just want to give information on the update of COVID-19. Um, efforts to vaccinate employees continued into early February with a second round of clinics for fire service personnel hosted by Con Fire and San Ramon Valley Fire. These clinics made second COVID-19 vaccines available to those who had already received the first dose. Um, responding to requests from the state and Contra Costa County Health Services in January, Con Fire worked with other county fire jurisdictions to organize and conduct a series of recurring public vaccination clinics beginning since February 1st. Each clinic has been provisioned to administer up to 500 shots daily. In week one, two clinics were conducted and that number is expected to rise to four clinics per week um, in week three. So that's coming up. The clinics will alternate between East and West Contra Costa locations with an eventual goal of 4,000 vaccinations per week. These clinics are expected to continue based on availability of vaccines, of course, 
Um, and this is to continue to, through at least April 1st. Um, I was at the Valley Bible Church uh, assisting there with everything from helping park cars to administer, um, to uh, checking their, administ uh, their information and, you know, confirming who they are, their date and all that stuff. And now uh, we'll be also giving out the vaccine. Um, so a lot of people are coming through. Um, two days ago, there were 90 people who were registered who didn't show up. So, you know, it, it was kind of a scramble there, but uh, it's still working. It's still a good work in progress. Uh, Confire obtained and has now distributed antigen test kits to the field for near real-time testing around the clock. And I have a kit right here, so I'm able to, if people think that they were exposed, we can actually test them right there so that um, they don't have to go somewhere, get tested and wait, you know, when they could possibly be spreading it. These test kits will allow us to better determine when COVID-like symptoms should result in precautionary isolation of employees. We are hopeful this will allow us to reduce the need to take people off work for extended periods of time. Uh, fire district annexation study update. And this is uh, phase two of the fire district's consolidation study initiatives. Initiative moves into its second full month in early February. Phase two is the examining the two potential annexations in great detail, including interviews with a variety of, st of stockholders. We expect results of phase two to be available for decision making by for each of the three districts in mid 2021. So coming up soon. And then last thing, operations ups, updates. In January, Confire welcomed our newest battalion chief to our chief officer ranks. Sydney Jacket is the district's first female battalion chief. She has worked for the district since 2002, serving in both the suppression and training divisions. In addition, she has participated in several organizational initiatives, including rapid intervention crew curriculum and development of the eBRICS radio system transition. Uh, her most recent staff assignment was a ship training captain and safety officer. And I worked with Sydney for years and she's an excellent addition to the battalion chief ranks. That's the end of my report. Open to any questions. Okay, uh, are there any questions from the uh, council? Thank you very much for your presentation, Chief Thomas. Yes, Any sir. questions from the council? Okay, if there are no questions for Chief Thomas from the council, I'd like to open it up to the floor, members of the community. Any questions for Chief Thomas? Okay, thank you so much for your presentation and keep up the great work. Uh, we're very grateful for everything you do for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You guys have a great night. Okay, you too. And so now I'd like to move to the uh, California Highway Patrol. And I see o Officer Leviste is here. And so we'll go straight into his presentation. And there's another officer <clears throat> on too. Yes. Yeah, we also have we also have Officer Lenway here, my, my partner officer um, in attendance. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to start off with addressing uh, last month's issues. Uh, an issue that was brought up to me uh, last month was the um, parking of big rigs near the intersection of San Pablo Dam Road and La Honda. Um, we spoke uh, here on the MAC meeting about putting up some signage, uh, looking into putting up some signage and saying uh, no parking near that intersection. Uh, coincidentally, when I went out there shortly afterwards, uh, some signs had been put up. So I, I'd love to take the credit for that one, but somebody else uh, beat me to the punch there. I'd love to take the uh, credit too, but I have no <laughs> idea who put in the request or how long ago it was put in. They just showed up. People called the office and yeah, I, I thought it was, I was well, just asking if it was you. Okay. Somebody. <laughs> I, I wish. I wish it was me. I wish I could take the credit, but it wasn't. Uh, but I did want to reach out and ask uh, if 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 the signs did have the intended uh, intended um, response or did yep. it did it work? So four residents have called me in the last two weeks about the signs, 
and one of the one of the uh, constituents lives virtually across the street, and he said there have been zero big RV truck anything that have parked anywhere in that area. And the biggest issue for them is coming out line of sight, you know, making turns. So he said that it has been it has been really really good. And in fact, the county picked up a little trash while they were out there putting the signs up too. <laughs> I'm good. Uh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, the, the, the second the second issue I wanted to bring up uh, that was brought up last month was the speed on San Pablo Dam Road last, uh, excuse me, not San Pablo, uh, Hillcrest, uh, Hilltop, Hilltop, sorry. Um, I, I spoke about how I was out there enforcing a lot of the um, uh, stop sign and uh, stop sign violations, um, which I was, I was relatively successful with. Uh, when I went to do a little bit of homework um, on the speeding, um, what I found was the speed survey for that uh, stretch of road is actually expired as far as my records are concerned. Uh, what I did was I did reach out to um, Mr. John Swan and I, I, he's my point of contact into getting a new survey uh, or a survey updated for that stretch of road. So just to give a little background on how things work, uh, a speed survey has to be done for, um, in order for, for us to enforce um, speed on for a speed limit sign. Um, the reason for that is, is because, uh, so that way we can't just put arbitrary speed limits and say that, oh, the, the speed limit is 15 miles an hour. That's not how it works. So um, what the county does is they go out there and they send um, surveyors out to see what the uh, average traffic conditions are like. And they take a lot of different things into consideration, like say, for example, if there's schools, if there's businesses, crosswalks, uh, and, and they find, and they come up with a report that, that recommends a safe speed. Now, those surveys have to be updated uh, routinely. Um, and the one that we had on file for, uh, for um, Hilltop was uh, beyond um, the date at which I could, I could, um, legally enforce the speed to that uh, for that stretch of road. So I've already um, um, got the ball rolling and 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 uh, made the effort to get that survey updated. So that way, when it does um, get updated, then we can go out there and start enforcing the speeds out there. So I am aware that speed um, up there is a, is is an issue. And I'm I'm taking the steps to make sure that uh, I can get out there and, and take care of business. Um, I'm obviously still aware of the speed down, down on San Pablo Dam Road. That's going to be a continuing uh, issue. Uh, and lastly, the, uh, the sideshows. I mean, we, we, we talk about this uh, almost every month, and it's an ongoing problem. It's not only in El Sobrani. It's not only in Contra Costa. It's, this is actually a nationwide phenomenon. Um, I'm 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 reading up on reports where this is this is going across going on nationwide maybe even worldwide just because of the conditions that we're living in with the with the pandemic and 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 people are I guess are bored at home and they want to go out and have some fun so uh, but it is still on our radar we still continue to uh, do the best we can to deter these um, takeover events we, we're we're calling them takeover events because essentially it's a mob mentality they they come out and they they flood a particular area and you know, have their fun until we were able to disperse them. Um, that's all I had. I don't know if uh, Officer Lenway, did you have any anything to add there? No, I think you, you covered it. I mean, the, the, the sideshows are the, a big hot button right now as far as the, the our department and, and this area and the nationwide. And it's, a, and it's a tough, we have a lot of challenges uh, reacting to that because they're, the numbers are definitely on their side. And uh, unfortunately, they they are aware of it too, and our hands are tied. So we're trying kind of try to just push them off, and, and to, once they've done their thing, and try to, to grab the, the the major trouble troublemakers and uh, use use the assets we do have as far as the airship and the, the staffing we do have to to enforce the laws that we that we're able to. Okay. Thank you. So, do we have any? Questions. I see we have a question from the council from George for officers in the beast state and Lenway. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, how long do you anticipate that speed survey to, to be complete? How long will it take to complete that survey? Typically, they're done pretty quickly. It's just a, a matter of if the resources are available. What they have to do is they have to send, they have to put a machine out there and they actually record the vehicles over, I believe it's a, a one week period. 
um, and then get an average of the speeds that typically go through that area. Um, and and I've had uh, I've had pretty good response from uh, Mr. John Swan, so I, I I would anticipate getting that done within the month. Okay, um, it's it's just a concern with the factors of it of the, the way that people speed coming uh, from the freeway going towards Nelson Ramsey. So I would say that would be eastbound. So that might skew the data. A little no, I, in fact, in fact, what uh, the the fact that there's there's more vehicular travel because it's the proximity to the freeway and because people are using these main thoroughfares to kind of bypass a lot of the traffic that 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 all that information is t taken into consideration um i would hope that when the um they the, the um the people that uh, put do the surveys usually let us know um when they do the surveys so that when they're out there reporting the seats. You know, if, if there happens to be a CHP officer that entire week's standing right next to the machine, so everybody tends to slow down right there. I mean, you know, hey, the, 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 <laughs> it, might, it might work in our, in our favor. I don't know. So, but the, that's, that's, uh, that's um, again, that in order for us to legally enforce those speed limits, we have to make sure that we do these uh, these things properly because otherwise what, what ends up happening is I write those tickets and then they, these people take me to court and I can't, I can't testify to it because it's not, it's not a legal um, means of uh, enforcement. Okay. So uh, have the other local authorities been notified of this? I know the CHP is aware of it. Have you reached out to the sheriff's department because one side of the hilltop or most of it is, is, is the county, but there's a stretch of it and the city of Richmond because there's a stretch of it right by across from the entrance to the Memorial Park. That's the city yeah. of Richmond. Those authorities have been notified as well. You bring up a good point. Because the uh, hilltop is segmented into part of it is unincorporated, part of it is city. I'm specifically talking about just the um, the unincorporated um, portion of hilltop. So that um, that okay. stretch of roadway is, is where the the surveys expired. It's a bit of a bit of a problem there because um, from say the entrance to the Memorial Park up to say the Mormon Church, um, the one side of it, I will call it the south side of it, is county. The north side of it is city of Richmond. <clears throat> so I'm just saying because that's the, that little stretch there, the road. Ah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I misunderstood your question. Yeah. So um, I have not reached out to Richmond. Um, I, I'm just taking the initiative here and, and having them do the survey because the survey will will span that entire stretch of roadway, both both directions, both directions. Okay. So and even that, I know that the, the survey that I have on file is expired. Um, I don't believe that Richmond I haven't seen them up there enforcing speed uh, particularly, so I don't. I'm. I don't think that they are aware that the survey is expired as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and have them do the survey, so that way it, it covers um, both directions. Okay, that would be good. And last but not least, it's totally unrelated. Maybe you don't know, but I'd love to know how. Uh, this was either Sunday night or Monday night, uh, 80 eastbound, right before Appian Way. I'd love to know how that car got where it got. If you're if you're familiar at all, there was uh, the traffic was very slow. Two CHP cruisers, and there was a car that went off the freeway, way off the freeway. Like, like <laughs> if it's like, but if you don't know about it, that's fine. I just really like you know I didn't expect to see a car where it was. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, yeah, I unfortunately I don't know. I've actually been out on injury for the past couple of weeks, so thus I'm thus I'm in my my garage here. I don't know. Maybe Officer Lenway has some info on that. I don't. I don't have. So, info. I hadn't heard about that one yet. I'll I'll have to ask around. But there was a it was eastbound at Apian. It was way off the freeway. I mean, we're talking like um, there's there's sort of a little bit of a homeless encampment down in there. It's it's sort of if you were on Dam Road. And you were at the the storage place that's kind of across the street from the car wash, and uh -huh. you went straight down in that uh, area of down there. That's where the car was. So uh -huh. it's like, and the, the the officers are out there, uh, flashlights in hand, trying to see if there was any activity in the car. It was uh, it's like uh, never seen a car in that spot before. It's the craziest thing. So uh, yeah, I don't know about that one. 
Okay. So we'll just have to chalk that one up to human ingenuity, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you we, like to call it, we like to call it natural selection. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have no more. I'm done. Thank you. So, thank you so much for the questions. Do we have any other questions from the council or our CHP representatives? If not, I'd like to open it up to the floor from the community. Any questions for the CHP representatives? Pam Morris has her hand up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, is my voice loud enough? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just have a question that I hope is on topic. I've lived here 27 years, and I've been noticing um, maybe the last five years that there's been quite a few shootings, maybe once every six months. But um, I've, I've been noticing that these shootings are occurring on my exit which is either Appian Way or San Pablo Dam Road or even Carlson. And I'm just wondering, um, is it my imagination or are we actually having some shootings along 80 that, um, yeah, that's my question. No, you're absolutely right. Um, what, what these criminals have, have found is that um, doing their shootings on or near the freeway affords them a very quick exit and a very hard time to do an investigation. Typically when we have freeway shootings, we have to shut down the entire freeway so that way we, we can walk, literally walk the all the lanes of the freeway and so we can collect these shell casings. So it makes, it makes investigating the shootings extremely hard. Um, and I think they've picked up on that. So they tend to, they, the, the, we're getting more and more of these freeway shootings. We do have, um, the number of shootings here on the eight, the 80 corridor have gone up. Uh, the number of shootings, especially on the Highway 4, 24, and 242 corridors as well have been have, have been skyrocketing. Um, I can't speak to why uh, they're happening. Um, I can only guess that it has something to do with uh, the pandemic and everybody's just uh, bored at home. I, I, I hate to use that as like a blanket uh, excuse, but um, you know, the, the times that we're in is, is very unusual. So any outliers like this I, is, is maybe a uh, valid. Could I ask two follow-up questions real quick? Shoot, please. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, okay, two questions. My first question is then from what you're saying, it, it appears these are not like drug related. Um, these are not like a, a drug deal going wrong or a gang thing. These are actually people, normal people just being shot along 80? Is that what we're talking about? Not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, I will say that some of the shootings that are investigated are um, mistaken identity. Some of them are, um, like you mentioned, um, gang related activity. Uh, I can't speak to, to all of them because I, I wasn't directly involved with the investigation, um, but it is, it is a, a troubling trend that uh, seems to be on the rise. Um, and, you know, unfortunately they, they've, they've found an outlet or found a, a location where it's, it's much harder for us as law enforcement to, to investigate the, the shootings themselves. So, um, but I mean, we are, we are making some, some progress there. Um, there are arrests being made and, and some of the shootings are linked to other shootings. Um, but, um, your, 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 um, assessment is correct. There is a, a rise in the number of shootings. And, and I think that's just, uh, crimes in general, um, right now are, are going up. Okay. And just my last, um, I guess this is a, a question, but it might be a comment, but really it's a question. So is there a way that um, some cameras could be put up? Because without having uh, evidence of who this was, it's impossible, as you mentioned, to find these people. And, when, and cameras could be a, a help in, in solving it. But more than that, hopefully it would be a deterrent. Is that something that could be, could happen? If so, how would that how would that occur? How, what's the next step for that to be? In well, actually, we are actually using cameras uh, currently, and not only that, we have a a, a program called Shot Spotter um, that it it kind of triangulates where the the sound comes from and gives us a better idea of where to send um, send our resources. So we are 
um, tapping into technology and using uh, technology to our advantage. Um, and it is helping us by far. I mean, we, we recently, uh, within the last year, installed these uh, license plate reader cameras on the, on the freeway. And it's helped us catch many, many um, felonious vehicles traveling up and down our freeway. So it is some cameras are something that are are our tool that we have been using and we continue to use. Thank you. So thank you very much for the questions, Pam. Are there any further questions from the audience for uh, officers of the East Day and Ledway? So if there are no further questions for our CHP representatives. We'll thank them both for serving our community and keeping us safe. And no, thank, uh, you. thank you, everybody. Thanks for having us. And as always, I'm going to leave my email in the comment section. So if there's any traffic related issues or any other questions you have for me, uh, feel free to email me. Okay, Likewise. great. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. So next, we will move into a presentation by Sophia Skoda, the finance director from East Bay Municipal Utility District and her team to discuss budget and rates. Hi, Sophia. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. <laughs> hey, Sophia, so, uh, this is Clifford. Hey. I think Charles is gonna introduce Clifford and I think director Young yeah, you brought the big guns out. We right? did bring the big guns. We knew you'd I'm be impressed. there, so. I'm impressed. Well, maybe I'll start just given the time. Um, but uh, <laughs> my name is uh, Clifford Chan. I'm the general manager for East Bay Mud. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today we have a, a short presentation to tell you a little bit about East Bay Mud, our finances, and our budget and rates process. And uh, you've uh, seen Sophia Skoda, our finance director. She'll make the presentation. But uh, before she starts, um, I'd like to hand it off to Marguerite Young, your East Bay Mud board member, to uh, say a few words. Hi, sorry, I didn't realize, I'm doing this from my phone, so I didn't realize I'm, um, uh, I was on mute. Um, uh, it's been a while since I've been able to address the MAC, and I'm glad to be here. And this is a meaty presentation, so I'm not going to take a whole lot more time. But um, uh, I just want to say what a great job, um, or how proud I am, actually, of this uh, agency for how it's been stepping up to address uh, the water-related issues of COVID. Um, and to our uh, employees, which I guess at least one of them is in the room that's not, that's part of the MAC, George, um, and uh, to, you know, keep the water flowing and to do their best to stay safe at work. Uh, so let me turn that over back to Clifford or over to Sophia. Your way works. I'll go ahead. All right, well, um, good evening and thank you for your time this, uh, this evening. And I, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right in. So um, one thing you may or may not know uh, is that East Bay Mud is a not-for-profit public agency. And that means that we're not a state or a county agency, we're what's called a special district. And so we have special responsibilities for water and wastewater services under the California Mud Act. And we have a seven member elected board. And so Director Young, whom you just heard from is one of those. And, and she is the person that represents um, uh, the area that the MAC represents as well. Um, and so an, another thing is um, that, that we wanted to, to say as a team as we go in is that we're really a part of the East Bay and its history and we're deeply committed to its future. Um, our mission is to manage the natural resources with which the district is entrusted to provide high quality, reliable water and wastewater services at fair and reasonable uh, rates for the people of the East Bay and also to preserve and protect our environment for future generations. And I'm gonna be coming back to some of that. Um, so moving on to the next slide, actually it sort of relates. How old do you think East Bay Mud is? Does anyone have any ideas? I know, but I'm not going to say because I will Thank you, know. George. <laughs> 60 years old. 60. 60? Oh, that was one guess. Did I hear any others? Yes, because I'm in the chat too. Oh, 100. Okay. Let's see who's what, what, what we've got in the chat here. 
Okay, so we have 60 and 100. Well, whoever said 100 is the one that's closest. So we are 98 years old and we are, um, you know, going to be turning 100 very soon. So whoever, whoever said that, um, nice work. And I would um, give you a chocolate or something, but, you know, it's virtual. So, uh, so before I tell you, um, uh, you know, where our water comes from, I, I want to provide you a little bit of history about our district. And my lesson will be shallow compared with that that Clifford um, could give you, our general manager. He is the son of a former history professor. So if you're interested, please certainly follow up with us and, and with him. Um, so East Bay Med was created almost 100 years ago, and it was because local water sellers were expensive and they were unreliable. Um, so, you know, as you go on walks around the East Bay, you might see um, some of our infrastructure caps, you know, in the street that say East Bay Water Company or People's Water Company or Contra Costa Water Company. And those were those three ones were really uh, main pieces of, of early East Bay mud. And, and that's because that's where that's where our roots, you know, were essentially. And so rapid population growth and a severe drought meant that, um, you know, these agencies that weren't able to, these companies, that, you know, private companies weren't able to meet that need, um, you know, meant that there was kind of need for a strong and reliable system. And so we were organized under the Municipal Utilities District Act in California. Um, and so this history means that we're very cognizant that, uh, uh, you know, part of our mission is uh, that we have to focus on fair and reasonable rates because, um, you know, we were created because others didn't essentially. So um, while we're 100, because we've inherited systems, um, we have infrastructure that can be 150 years old. Uh, so there are definitely times when there are lines that our, our staff is working on that are that old, if you can believe it. Um, so as I get started, a theme that you're going to hear throughout this, this evening is, is investment in infrastructure. And so we need to be ready for the next 100 years to serve the East Bay. Next slide. So this really shows here um, a um, kind of graphic. Actually, go back to the last slide, Charlotte. So I apologize. Um, just really, really quickly on the last slide. This sort of shows the Sierras and the snowmelt, and that's really the source of, of um, most of our water. Um, that snowmelt ends up in the McCulmy River um, and, um, and in part behind Party Reservoir. That's the, the main reservoir that serves um, our area. A lot of people think it's Hetch Hetchy, but it isn't. We have our very own Reservoir Party. We also have a, a Reservoir Comanche that people might be aware of um, for recreation purposes, and, and that's to meet our environmental requirements on the river. And then, um, and then we've got these huge, um, large um, pipes, these aqueducts that carry the water 90 miles back into the Bay Area. So if you move to the next slide, um, what you'll see there is, is that kind of 90 miles from an overview perspective. So down um, all the way into the East Bay, into our service area. So moving on to the next slide. We serve about 1.4 million customers water um, and a subset of that, about 740,000 um, customers based on uh, the, the most recent data that's available with wastewater service. Um, and so this map kind of in the crosshatched area is both water and wastewater. And then just the green area, which the MAC is also representing is, is a water service area. So, so um, we provide you with water service essentially. Um, and so we have some data here on, on the, the number of uh, reservoirs and treatment plants and, um, and pipelines that we have. And we have a pretty complex system. We, we've got a lot of um, elevation um, in our uh, service area. We've got warmer areas, cooler areas. So we have a pretty complex system that we manage here. And on the wastewater side, um, we have a treatment plant that is uh, treating about, on average, 50 million gallons per day. Although when it rains, it can it can be you know you know almost 10 times that amount, um, which has its own complications. But if you ever want to go on a wastewater tour, we're now offering virtual tours, so we invite you. Next slide. Oh, I was going to ask a question, um, and the question was, how much do you think that water costs at East Bay Mud um, on average for a gallon? And uh, spoiler, because I already switched to the slide, and the answer is that it's about a penny a gallon. So, um, you know, we believe that's really great value. And again, 90% of that water is coming from the McCullamy River in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, um, and about 10% of it um, from local runoff um, in our areas, in our local reservoirs here. Um, and so these are just some statistics. Um, you know, we were treating on average 50 million gallons per day of wastewater um, and the number of pipes, uh, miles of pipe that we maintain and um, the number of acres of watershed land, which, which people might not be aware of. Um, and we also are delivering about 150 million gallons of water um, daily. So you might say, gosh, Sophia, so you're, um, 
150 million gallons a day is what you're delivering, but 50 million gallons is your wastewater treated. So two factors. So one, um, that obviously, you know, I, I did say that we have only about half of, of the service area is, is both water and wastewater. Um, but then the other thing is, don't forget water that is used on your garden doesn't come to the wastewater plant. So that is, um, that's why. So next slide. So we have a very large pipeline distribution system. I had this, this statistic on one of our prior slides, um, over 4,200 miles of pipeline. And if you're wondering how long that is, that's all the way from the Oakland A Stadium to Wrigley Field and all the way back again. So that's a lot of pipe for us to, to maintain, as you might imagine. Next slide. And we also are um, up and, and operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because we, we all need to be ready for you know, the minute that any uh, company or home needs uh, water. Um, and so these are just some shots in action of our staff. So on the next slide, um, this really shows some shots of our um, facilities that we that we have to maintain. Um, so we are, um, you know, we're really about our, our capital improvements, our, our infrastructure, and making sure that all of these facilities, these water treatment plants, pumping plants, reservoirs are ready for, for uh, meeting today's needs, and that they'll be ready when we start our second hundred years. Next slide. Uh, we also, you know, wanted to say that investing in infrastructure isn't only about projects. It also provides local employment um, through jobs um, at East Bay Mud and through contracts that we engage in. And so you may see uh, local residents working as flaggers, truck drivers, working um, on construction crews. And we also do try very hard to make sure that small, disadvantaged minority and um, LGBTQ Businesses get a fair share at our contracts through our award-winning contract equity program, which for more than 35 years um, has, uh, uh, you know, served our community and supported our community. And so that's um, $870 million in um, contracts awarded to these small and diverse businesses and more than 13 million in local construction um, over the last three years alone. So next slide. So this is just a shot of, of, um, of the work that we're doing with re regards to environmental stewardship. So this is just a couple of shots to show what we do. Um, I started off you know, sharing our mission. This is part of our mission. Um, you can see in the lower left-hand side, there's renewable green energy. Um, I'm gonna move for a minute to turn my lights back on. Hope this works. I'm back. Um, and you can see kind of in the top um, left-hand uh, quadrant, some of the open space, some of the acres that we preserve that, that are open, many, much of which is open to the public for, for hiking. Um, we, we see uh, pictures of, of some solar um, uh, panels that we have located on some of our properties. We're always looking for, for places to co-locate um, solar when it makes sense. Um, we produce hydropower. Um, you can see in the, in the shot of the dam there. And um, we contribute um, 20 to 40% um, in, in many years of the California uh, fishery of, of salmon. So that's pretty uh, amazing that our small river and the work that our, our staff does essentially is such a large piece of California salmon fishery. Um, next slide. So yeah, almost all of our um, rate dollars um, you know, people wonder, you know, what, what, where, what do you do when we send, when we, you know, when we pay our bills? And so uh, more than 50 cents, um, more than 50%, and that's 50 cents on each dollar, goes towards infrastructure improvements. Eight cents goes towards administration. 32 cents goes towards water service. Um, uh, four cents towards customer service. Two cents towards regulatory compliance. And about three cents to natural resources management. So that's how, how a dollar uh, breaks up. Next slide. Um, this shows our budget overall, and so in fiscal year 21, so we're in the midst of fiscal year 21, it'll be uh, completed at the end of June. So our budget was um, uh, just over $900 million, and about 40% of that went to capital improvements. But when you include that with our mortgage payment, which is our debt service payment, um, you know, that's really two thirds of our budget is about capital and it's about infrastructure and everything that we need to make sure that um, the minute that you need to turn on the tap, it's, it's ready. Um, the last third is, is about operations, so day-to-day -day costs. Next slide. So this slide really shows um, a kind of a low average and high water user for a single family home. So um, our average user uses 800 cubic feet of water 
Um, 100 cubic feet of water is about 748 gallons. And that bill for the average user is um, about $64 a month. Now, actually, more than 50% of our users actually use less than this amount. Our average and our median aren't the same. Um, and so low water users, many um, are low water users at, at 400 cubic feet. Um, on a monthly basis are paying about $45 per month. And then there are, of course, um, high users who, you know, perhaps live in, in a warmer part of our service area and also have very large, um, uh, you know, uh, gardens and so on, um, you know, are paying uh, $170 per month. Next slide. I also did want to note on that last slide, you don't need to turn back though, that um, most, more than 50% of our customers don't pay any kind of an elevation surcharge, but for, for any people that live um, in, in a hill, on a hill, um, uh, that we do charge, in, you know, in zones two and three an elevation surcharge to pay for the pumping plants and the energy that is needed to deliver that water. And um, the general manager uh, has mentioned, you know, before as kind of an analogy, imagine the number of Priuses that you would have to lift up um, uh, to, to someone's house, um, you know, with respect to how much energy Energy it would take to deliver that sort of weight of water. So this is what the actual bill looks like. And so this is um, uh, this is Nice Bay Mud Bill. And so you can see there, there's a, a water service charge that is a, a fixed portion every month. And then there's the amount that's based on the actual flow that's used. Um, we did want to show here that an average PG&E uh, bill for a month is about $180. Um, this bill that you're seeing here is actually a two month bill for um, you know, $140. And so um, this, this charge is, is somewhere in the realm of, of $70 um, a month. So um, we sometimes get um, uh, told, in fact, more frequently than, than we expect, oh gosh, you know, your bill is now more than PG&E. And um, A, you know, PG&E bills monthly and we bill for two months, um, but also it, that is not true for an average user. Next slide. Okay, so this just shows what our water bill is like um, uh, as compared with what the water bill might be like in other um, uh, you know, surrounding communities and, and others in the Bay Area. So you can see that there are ones that are uh, quite a bit higher for the same amount of water, San Francisco, for example, and there are ones that are very low, Pleasanton, for example, um, at the very low end there. So um, we're, we're right about in the, in the middle here. Next slide. And this is um, our budget adoption schedule. So we've got a two-year budget. We're um, uh, right in the middle of developing our budget. Right now, we held our first budget workshop with our board of directors on January 26th. Um, we are planning to hold a second um, uh, workshop on March 23rd. Um, we, we may need to hold a third workshop on April um, 13th. There's, there's the opportunity to do that. Um, and then we'll be sending out our Proposition 218 notices. So we send those out every two years to let, let everyone know what the proposed rates and charges are. We'll hold a public hearing on those proposed rates and charges on June the 8th. And um, if those were approved, they would go into effect on July the 1st. And so with that, um, we just wanted to make sure that you're aware that online we have resources um, on our finances and on our rates. We've got a budget and brief document that we um, won an award for from um, the GFOA, uh, which shares our kind of budget in a very brief kind of readable format for fiscal years 2021. We'll update that, of course, for whatever the budget is for 22 and 23. Um, our, our budget is available itself. Um, there's a, 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 a video of understanding East Bay Mud's water rates. There's a, um, a short um, uh, kind of written piece on our cost of service. Um, and so we, we want to you know, answer any questions and make, make available uh, information that people might need. Next slide. Um, we also want to make sure that, that everybody knows that we want to help anybody who is having trouble paying their water bill. We have an award winning and, um, you know, we, we think it's, it's, you know, perhaps the oldest uh, customer assistance program in the state of California. And um, we can help with, uh, with people's water bills. Um, we also have rebate programs. We have leak alerts. We have tools to help you track water use, um, tools to, to help you know how you can save water and money, um, free virtual classes on gardening and, and other things like that. We offer payment plans and extensions. Um, and the, this customer assistance program that I kind of started talking about as I, st as I started off on this slide, um, provides a, uh, um, about up to a 50% reduction on the, the water costs for a certain amount per person in the household and up to a 35% reduction on the wastewater costs. 
And we really want to get connected with anyone that might need help. So if you know anyone, please direct them to us. Um, uh, have them visit eastbaymed.com uh, backslash you know, CAP, Customer Assistance Program. Um, and also if you or anyone that you know um, is interested in learning more about um, how you can save water, um, identify leaks, uh, all of that, we, we have a lot of information on our website. If, if that's the preferred way, you can also call in um, and we can connect you with resources that you need. Next slide. Um, so with that, I, I think that we're ready to, to dig into questions. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Sophia, for uh, a really meaty presentation. And so I would like to open the uh, open questions to members of the board. Any questions from the board for uh, Sophia Skoda? You can call me later too. <laughs> okay. Any questions from the uh, audience, from the community? Pam Morris. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation and uh, thank you for uh, just being available. Um, I have two questions. I have a global question and a personal question. Okay. So the global question is, I, I could have misheard this date, but it seemed like it was 2030. That seems like maybe it can't be true. But the, the information was that the water treatment plants along the water, because of the rising tides, are going to have huge uh, infrastructure catastrophic problems soon. It, is um, East Bay Mud affected by that prediction? Um, so it's a this question basically about climate change. You know, as it turns out, um, Clifford Chan, who is the general manager, uh, it has been very involved with the efforts of the district to fight, fight climate change. So yes, we, I mean, we are impacted by climate change. Um, and so I'm gonna hand off the direct question to him. Yeah, um, there's a few things I would say. First, you know, we are concerned about climate change. Um, we have actually taken very aggressive action to reduce and mitigate our emissions. In fact, we've adopted the most aggressive uh, reduction goals um, in the nation of any utility. Uh, specifically to your question about sea level rise, um, the wastewater plant is actually um, uh, probably higher than you might think. Um, we have a presentation online. Um, if you look back at, in online on our uh, website, on board meetings uh, for October, we show um, various sea level rises and the impact of, um, uh, of that to our facility. So the wastewater plant itself, um, when you look at the projections going out to 2100, um, is not at risk. Um, we do have one facility kind of out, um, uh, you know, closer into the water. It's a dechlorination facility that probably most at risk. And so we are planning to address that. Thank you. And my, my second personal question. Um, so this last month, um, and I understand things are billed in several months increments, um, given that it was during the rainy season and for other reasons, uh, the dishwasher, the laundry, the showers weren't being used particularly. And yet my water bill was double what it was when I was watering the garden. So is this like some fluke, like maybe the guy who reads the meters didn't come by, or are you generalizing the rate based on the previous one, or, or I know this is yeah. not correct. No, Pam, it's funny that you say that. I actually have had the exact same experience, but I just got my <laughs> bill and I haven't had a chance to look into it yet. I, I, I see um, George very anxious to say something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like, I'd like to answer that. Um, Pam, I, uh, you probably heard, I work for East Bay Mud, been there almost 26 years in customer service. And I've dealt with that type of inquiry for all of my time there. Um, if the meter reader didn't read your meter, it would say on the bill estimated in terms of what the reading is. Um, if you have your bill, you can look at what the, it tells you what the meter reading was. You can go to the meter yourself and see if, if, if what is on your bill is in line with what it says at the meter itself. If you read the meter and you're like, oh, this reading is lower than what it says on my bill, you know, take a picture of the meter, including the meter number and email it to our customer service and say, you misread my meter, can you bill me again? And they'll do that. 
The other thing is if the reading is accurate, you might want to check and see if there could be something leaking in the house. I, as I said, I've been doing the customer service for almost 26 years. And one of the main things that can cause a leak and cause a bill to spike is a toilet leak. And I, people would always tell me, oh, that's impossible. There's no way my bill could be like that. It's like, well, we bill you every two months. And if, you're leaky, if your toilet is leaking 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two months, it can certainly add up. And there's yeah. very simple tests that you can do for your toilets to see if they're leaking. And this is for anybody on the call who's concerned about their bill. Um, you take some food coloring or some type of colored water, punch, cola, something, put it in, in the toilet tank. That's the back part. And let the, toilet, let the toilet sit at rest out being used for about 45 minutes and then check the water in the bowl. When the toilet's at rest, the tank water and the bowl water should not be able to commingle. So if you look at the toilet bowl and you've got the colored water in there, then you have a leaky toilet. You can fix your leaky toilet and then you can contact us and say, I got my bill and it was high and I found that I had a leaky toilet. Can you give me an adjustment on my bill? Answer is yes. And it's a certain, a certain amount of the bill that can be taken away. Um, so there is that. So check that as well. I mean, other possibilities for leaks you might have an irrigation system. They might have a leak. Check, check the nozzles to see if there is any wet spots around them, because in this time of the year, you shouldn't be using your irrigation system necessarily because it's, as you said, it's the rainy season. So those are things that you can check to see. Um, if you don't want to put punch or colored water into your toilet, you can contact our customer service group and they can Contact our water conservation folks and they can send you some dye tablets that you can put in the toilet instead. But that could be the reason why that, you know, th those are the reasons why the bill could be what it is. It could have been misread. That does happen. The guys, you know, we're human beings reading the meters and sometimes they make mistakes. Or it could just be something's leaking. And I speak as a customer because I've had issues with a leaky toilet and an irrigation system that went on the fritz and the main plumbing line that runs from the meter to my house that busted. And that cost me 1200 bucks to replace so those are the things that you can check into if you need to thank, so. thank and, you, and, thank you. And, and i'll add quickly george um just on that one too you know we are looking into um uh, what we call advanced metering infrastructure where we can read the meters remotely um through a radio system um that's still many years away if we decide to do that um, because to convert all nearly 400,000 customers to advanced meeting infrastructure would be about two to $300 million to do. Um, but in the meantime, we also offer a rebate up to 50% of a cost if you go online of what we call a flume device that you can, a homeowner can easily attach to their meter and you can get uh, near real time readings of your water meter and get alerts as well. We'll uh, rebate up to half the cost. So I think up to $100 on the cost of that flume meter. Um, and then uh, just quickly, I saw one other question in the chat about a pipeline project in a particular area. Um, and maybe Charlotte, if you can get that information. I don't know about that particular project, but what okay. I will say um, just very quickly uh, that, you know, Sophia is talking about our investment infrastructure. We do want to make very wise investments in our infrastructure. And especially for the pipeline, it costs about two and a half million dollars to replace one mile of pipe. And so we're very careful about selecting which pipes to replace. And so sometimes we're in an area and you you might be thinking, well, while you're here, why don't you just replace all the pipe in the area? It's because based on our analysis, most of the pipe is probably good and we're replacing the bad pipe. And we need to be very strategic about it because we wanna maximize the life out of the, the investments that we made in the infrastructure. Our, you know, our analysis is not perfect and sometimes we make mistakes because we can't see underground, but we do a very good job of picking the right pipe to replace. So, but the particular project in the chat, um, we'll have to get back to you. I, I don't know about those specifics. Um, okay, but, thank you. Sorry. Oh, 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 go ahead. If you have something to add to that. There is a pipeline job taking place. So I wanted to wait to give this piece since it is very specific to Elsa Bronte and the other infrastructure investments were kind of more general, but the ones that you can see in your own neighborhood are there is a pipeline replacement job that is working on St. Andrews Drive from La Loma Linda Avenue to Kelvin Road, also on Allview Avenue from Loma Linda to Kelvin, and then on Mitchell Way from Allview to Stallion Road. And that is project is under construction right now. And it is part of those pipeline replacement projects that Clifford has just mentioned. Um, and that is to replace several sections of pipe in the cluster. 
That is, we work on, on multiple pipes that are related to each other in the same pressure zone at the same time in the same area to make sure that we can be part about how we're investing in the infrastructure. And these are all pipes that have been identified as, as they're, they're reached the end of their useful life. So that project is underway and it's anticipated to end in March. And then there are two other projects in Elsa Bronte currently. There is one, um, an electrical and pumping plant upgrade at the Maloney pumping plant and Sobrante water treatment plant. And that's off of Valley View. And then also at La Honda de Avila. And then also there is a related project for making safety and maintenance improvements. And that's also at the Sobrante water treatment plant. And then the reclamation basin, which is across the street from the Maloney pumping plant off of de Avila. And then lastly, the one that I mentioned about a pipeline replacement. So I hope that helps answer the questions about um, individual pipeline replacements. We will have others upcoming in the area as we look and see and prioritize what pipes are aging and need replacement. Okay, thank you so much. We've got three questions. And Ben, Cooper, audience, is, ben, ben Cooper is first. I've been keeping track of that when the hands go okay, up. Okay, great, go ahead, James. Yep, go ahead, Ben. Thanks, James. Can you all hear me? Yep. Great. So yeah, Ben Cooper recently moved to El Sobrante um, from Oakland. My water quality seems great. No real difference from where I lived before. However, my, my sister lives nearby and her water, water quality is seemingly worse. Um, it's, you can taste the difference. And I was wondering um, what, you know, you send out the, the water quality report mailer every year for like your system wide and it's, you know, always great, which is awesome. But I was wondering how one would go about getting a more granular report for maybe their neighborhood or their block, or if they're having issues, how they might get testing done at their house. I can answer that if, if you don't mind. Um, give our uh, email or call our customer service and ask that you're concerned about water quality and you will be connected email. There will be an email sent to our system water quality group and they will reach out to the homeowner to find out what's going on. It could be something as simple as cleaning out the traps in the, in the faucets, you know, like in the kitchen, they have a little trap underneath and you clean that out. That will increase, that will uh, make the water quality in the house a little bit better. That's just what I know. I'm very limited on that, but I would say to give that, give our customer service a call or email and they will re refer you to our system water quality department to get that issue uh, looked at. George, can you put the phone number in the chat so Ben can jot it down? Oh, yeah, you, I will try my best. I'm on a tab. I'm using a tablet here, so it's very yeah, we, we can take care of that too, George, and, and we're going to have to bring you along to all the other presentations, George. <laughs> No, I know, George. No, no, <laughs> but but I'll, I'll also say, Ben, um, just as far as your question, our system water quality group can help out. And, and just because you, you might be kind of in the general vicinity of Sobrante, you might be getting water from a, a different water treatment plant. And so they can also answer that question as well. Sometimes the water quality, even from the same reservoir, can change from time to time. So um, the system water, group, uh, water quality group can answer all of those questions uh, very specific to your sister's situation. Is there a number? Oh, thank you. Uh, ben, the number's down in the chat if you can see it. I can, thanks everybody. Uh, Will Plute. Yeah, hi. Um, at South Lake Tahoe, they, uh, all, the, all the houses get alerts if you, well, you can sign up to get an alert if there's a sudden spike in your water use. And I believe Mr. Chan, you were just mentioning that as an optional thing we can do down here. If, so yes. I just kind of missed like where exactly could I get that information and is, is that what it is because you know pipes freeze up in Tahoe so if you're a thousand gallons of water going in a few hours they let you know right away and I think that's a good a good thing. Yeah so if you go online you can sign up for um, uh, you know get the water reports and water alerts but I do want you to be aware most of our customers right now only get their meters read once every two months so You'll, it'll let you know of a spike, but there could be a, a pretty significant gap in between because of that very large investment in the uh, in advanced meeting infrastructure that we're evaluating. And, and we'll, we'll just make that decision in the next year or so of what we do. But in the meantime, um, you can get the Flume device. You'll see a rebate on our website as well. That will give you, um, I think it's every five minutes, a re it takes a reading and you can get an alert if you have a um, sudden spike in your water use, it will send you an alert. So that, that could span the gap between uh, how we do our bi-monthly meter reads 
um, and when we decide whether whether or not we move forward with um, the advanced metering infrastructure. So that's called flume, like a water flume. Like a water flume, if yeah, you okay. the rebates, um, and it's a it's a very easy application process. You buy the device, you provide a receipt, and we'll we'll give you a rebate for half the cost of that device. Do you have a ballpark on what what those cost? It's uh, two hundred dollars. Oh, okay, great, thank you. And. Pam Morris, I see your hand back up. Okay. Um, yeah, just two real quick questions. Um, one, a real general question. The other one, a little bit more uh, personal. So the general question is, when you guys replace the pipes in, in El Sobrani, because they're old, um, what kind of material are you replacing them with? Are you putting copper in or are you putting in uh, PVC? What, what are you doing? What kind of pipe? It, it depends on the, the situation, if there are hazards, if there's a fault zone. So if there's a landslide or if there's a, um, if it's in a landslide area or a fault zone, um, we would typically put in steel um, or we put in uh, what we call um, earthquake resistant ductile iron pipe. Um, uh, sometimes we'll put in plastic pipe, we put in PVC pipe, but it's an enhanced type of PVC. Um, uh, if anybody's worked with PVC on a home garden, you know how brittle it can be. Um, the pipes that we use um, is not brittle. Um, and so it's just an enhanced PVC. Those are our standard materials right now. It, um, but our, our go-to material going forward is ductile iron pipe. So very similar to the cast iron pipe, but not as brittle as cast iron pipe. Great, thank you. And then um, George, you mentioned that your own um, $1,200 cost of a broken uh, water line, I guess, uh, was something you had to endure. I, I see these ads that, you know, these insurance companies offer. Oh, if you have a water pipe break, it's $15,000. You only have to pay us, blah, blah, blah. And I've heard they're scams. So what do we, what do we do to protect ourselves from a water main? I guess I shouldn't call it a water main, a water pipe uh, supply line that that's on our property. What what do we what are we supposed to do about protecting that? Uh, or insuring it, I guess. That's a that's a good question. I wouldn't know the yeah. answer to that. I, I, why don't I start so, and so, deferred, you can jump in. So I'll just start with uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call those programs scams necessarily. There are some, there are more than one company that's available. Some of them are better quality mm -hmm. than others. It's just a question of you know, whether or not you, you're concerned about the possibility, you know, do you, do you think that it's a, like, a high likelihood or not? You know, if you have a very old home, maybe, and, and, and you, you, you know, your budget is such that, you know, um, you, you know, really kind of think like, oh, if I had to spend, you know, $1,200, you know, that is not something, you know, I remember when I, um, um, you know, there were a couple, uh, there were some years ago where I decided to have wire insurance for my phone, which was like five or $10 a month, because I wasn't at that point able to kind of deal with kind of a large one-time charge. But then at some point I gave up the five or $10 a month wire insurance because I felt comfortable being able to cover the cost if, if the, the line stopped working and I was going to have to pay for it. This is in the day of landlines. I'm dating myself, I realize. So it's sort of that kind of a calculation that you have to make for yourself. Um, but I would, I would not say that, that they are necessarily scams and, and you, know, you, you can look at the ratings with the Cal California Consumer Bureau and so on and so forth. But, but um, I'll add, uh, let, let Cliff to add to that yeah i will say i mean it depends on the the on your private side what pipe you're concerned about are you concerned about the the service line from our meter that just goes into your house or the pipe in your house uh depending on the age of, of your home and whether you did anything there's a good chance that you have galvanized pipe and um just so you know galvanized pipe uh, in general corrodes from the inside out so you can look at the pipe from the outside and it'll look perfectly good but on the inside it's entirely corroded um, so you need to do that evaluation to see whether or not you have galvanized pipe, uh, copper pipe inside your house. Um, if that's what you're concerned about. Um, and then also the configuration of your house and, and you know, where your, your washing machine, where your, you know, all your appliances are. That is like for me, um, my washer is in the basement. So if it broke, it's just going right into a drain and it's not going to cause any damage. But if your washing machine is up on a finished floor, you might be a little more concerned about that one. For the line from your meter to your house, there are insurance companies that will insure if that breaks that um, you can pay you know, some nominal amount of money. And if it breaks, they'll come out and repair it. 
And there are, um, you know, several companies that do that. And, you know, you can look up, you know, whether or not you, um, you know, their ratings and decide whether or not that's something you want to invest in. Um, but again, that's an evaluation. If you have nothing but a lawn in front, if it breaks and uh, you have, you know, you're not worried about it, um, you might not want to invest in that, that insurance. If you have lots of expensive gardening and landscaping, uh, you might think about it. So um, it, th there's a few factors you have to consider, but there are insurances out there and it's really um, a, a personal risk assessment. Is there any way to get the pipes inspected so I could determine are they going to last or not? Is there any way to do that? For the inside of your house. No, I mean, no, no. For the, for the line, for the line. Excuse me for interrupting. Uh, for the line from the uh, service center into the house, that line. Yeah, um, what I would do is, um, you know, hire a plumber that you trust and, you know, they can usually look at what's coming into your house and what's in the meter box and they can make an assessment of um, uh, the type of pipe that you have and they can probably give you an opinion on whether or not they think it would need to be repaired or not. But I, I would just uh, hire a plumber to, um, to do that, somebody that you trust. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Do we have any additional questions uh, from the audience for the Edmund team. If we don't have any additional uh, presentations, I mean, additional questions, I would like to thank uh, Sophia and Clifford and Sharla and the whole Edmund team who came to present really excellent material. And uh, I really appreciated the getting pointed to the online material. So uh, have a good look at that. And, you know, we know where to reach you if we have questions. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. We know it's late on a, on a Wednesday. So I definitely appreciate Supervisor Joy. I definitely appreciate you all coming and spending some time with us this evening. Um, and Charla, I will be in touch. Um, George, were you going to say something before I started running my mouth? I, I, I feel no, like no, people will just bug me. They don't have to, they don't have to talk to the, the folks who came from, from my company. They can just nag me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> do, do the right, do we'll do be the in right. touch. Next. So way. George is Mr. Toilet Diagnostics. Um, <laughs> that is perfect. Hey, Mr. I, Toilet I, Diagnostics. I thank you so much. All everybody. Right. All right, thank thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. So now uh, we would normally talk about um, development plan applications, variance reports, building modification, modification requests, et cetera, but it doesn't look like we received any applications this month. So we're gonna go straight into the public comment item. And so these are items to anybody with a comment can get up to speak and it's a limit of two minutes per speaker. So uh, council members, audience, feel free to give us your two cents worth or two minute cents worth or however it's uh, measured. Can I jump in there real fast? Absolutely. Whenever Supervisor Joya presents, I, I remove myself from having a presentation. Um, but two things that I wanted to mention, one is going to be a link to an article. Um, Confire has, I'm sorry, let me raise up my monitor. They have been busy. Um, the headline of the article is Confire investigators announce busy start to new year with seven arson arrests in just more than one month. Um, in eight separate arson incidents in Antioch, Concord, Pittsburgh, Pleasant Hill, and Walnut Creek. Um, I just wanted to mention that so folks are, are aware of just some of the other things that the fire district is doing. Um, many years ago, maybe over the last 10, maybe 12 years, there were a string of, fi of arsonists and cars being set on fire and things like that in El Sobrani around the May Road area for a little while. So anything with arson, I like to hop in real quick and, and let folks know the good work that Confire is doing. And then the last thing is to frame the vaccination um, piece that John spoke about yesterday. Gilbert Salinas, the health office, the health services department chief equity officer gave a, a, a number. There are 10,000 more appointments than we have vaccines for. There, so when we talk about need and, uh, and we're just one county of 58 in this state, 
um, not to mention the other 49 states in all their counties and it being distributed. And, and I'm saying that to, to help us all frame you know, our expectation. I'm 36. I, I, I'm not going to get the vaccine till probably 2022. I mean, so I just, you know, as we're going forward, as we're having discussions with our neighbors and family and friends, just as Supervisor Joy captured, it is not a, a system issue. We can get the doses out to people, our, our fire, um, and then like the Safeways and the Walgreens, you know, everybody is doing what they can to get the vaccine out there. We are truly and um, and an issue with the supply. So I just I just wanted to let everybody know, you know, that's what we're looking at. That was yesterday in the board meeting that we have ten thousand more appointments than we do um, than we have vaccines for people. So any bit of uh, um patience that folks can um, have with us while we all want the vaccine or those that do want the vaccine want to have access to it right away, that just may not be possible right at this moment. So. So I just have a couple of things to add to that. And, and then, Harry, them, then Harry and then Will after you, Tom, for public comment. Okay, sorry. I, no, I just no, wanted no, to add to that. So I, th I think two considerations, one of which I think the supply situation probably within the next couple of months will start to be ameliorated. One, because it's a top priority of the federal government. And two, because there are two brand new vaccines which will be coming on to market. So uh, there's sort of good news from that front. And on the other front, I would just urge everybody here to relay to the greatest extent possible, you know, the need to maintain social distancing, to be very careful with respect to masking, including double masking. And the county has guidance on how to do that because you know, we have a couple of new variants, one from the UK, one from uh, South Africa, other variants from Brazil, which have the characteristic of being much more uh, spreadable. And, you know, we're so close to having these vaccines readily available, you know, it would really be a shame to be the last people to get COVID. So keep that keep those precautions going it's so important and sorry for uh ranting it's my pet peeve but uh we'll go ahead and it looks like we have two comments james can you take them away director harry and then will Plute. hi everybody um i'm i'm on the board of the west county wastewater district and i wanted to piggyback onto the presentation by east bay mud we're also going to be 100 years old this year and um, we represent uh, the wastewater portion of East Bay Mud's double uh, duty. We are your wastewater, not East Bay Mud. So if you have a problem um, with your systems, contact uh, us. Our website is uh, wcwd.org, pretty simple. I put it in the chat. And maybe um, one day I'll uh, beg to get some time and I can do a presentation similar to um, East Bay Muds in terms of our um, budget. And uh, we do have our five-year um, plan up on our website. And that'll give you an idea about uh, what we're doing and where we're at and our um, costs, et cetera. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Blue, Will? Yeah, hi. Um, at a recent meeting, I talked to all of you about the uh, city of Richmond proposing cutbacks in the fire department. And I think there was interest in maybe writing a letter to the city, but I just wanted an update, give you an update. I've heard recently from the fire un firefighters union that the city's decided to wait until their normal uh, negotiations in the fall to propose anything. So I'm wondering, I'm not sure, maybe is it a good idea that you would go ahead and write in support of us now? Or I'm thinking maybe it's better to wait till closer to the time where they're actually gonna be working on that issue to, to get support for not cutting back uh, the fire service in our area. I, I, I happen to, in my 
ex little experience working here. If you send a letter too early, it will get lost. Right. I just, it, it just, it, you know, it kind of happens that way, um, okay. unfortunately. Also along those lines, Supervisor Joy and I talked um, uh, after Melinda sent me an email regarding that. What John wants um, is asking the fire protection district to do is keep us aware. You know, they are in constant talks with the city of Richmond. There aren't, I think Richmond is one of the only, you know, cities. Well, now there's some other cities that have their own fire departments, but Con Fire does the bulk of the firework in, in Contra Costa County. So he's asked the chief, you know, in his discussions, if they become aware, because, you know, Richmond would have to notify Con Fire of any uh, potential closures just because of the impact to our, our system. So John has asked the chief to you know keep us aware me um john and the the moment i hear any sort of a sniff of that you all are going to get emailed um okay. it has been a very popular topic throughout richmond um and you know we we all understand the impacts and why it's necessary to stay on top of that so my my you know uh thing for all of you is that once i know you all will find out i won't be waiting around to one of our mac meetings to tell you all here it'll it'll come in an email so that way people can get their comments in um, in plenty of time and everyone can be heard. But as of now, um, as Will said, there's there's no no plan for, as far as we know for that. For any right, no, I'll be asking around all the time, trying you know, and let everybody know when I, if I hear anything. So yeah, I guess we just hold off for now and see what happens next. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Will. Thank you, thank and you thank Melinda. Mary. Are there any further uh, comments, open comments? Okay, it looks like uh, no takers for that. Um, so the next item, information reports by MAC members. I don't have any information reports to give. Do, are there, no? So we'll go on to subcommittee reports and uh, Normally we might have a report from Mickey, but on the um, the illegal dumping subcommittee, but uh, it doesn't look like that's going to be a factor tonight. Um, announcements, the March SMAC meeting will be focused on an update from the planning department regarding the Envision Contra Costa 2040 plan update. Um, please send agenda items and speaker proposals for upcoming SMAC meetings to James. And James, I'd like to suggest that perhaps in April or May, we have a detailed COVID update from our county public health officer. Maybe we want to back that off until May because then we'll get, you know, we'll have a volume of data coming from new vaccines and things and you know, we might have an idea of how this is affecting COVID rates in our community. Okay. Um, so you asked me in January for that, and I sent the request to the health department. They're going to have someone in April, so I can change. Okay, it. I can change it to April. I can change it to April. No, I I, if, April to if, May. if they've agreed, if they've agreed, if they've agreed, let's keep them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they've got a lot of a lot on their plate. So given the time. Given You'll three months notice that. helps with someone saying yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Melinda. That'll be April. And next yeah. month's meeting is just going to be the general plan update. I wanted to mention that. We're not going to have Super. any other reports. So it may be a long meeting. It may be a short meeting. But March is going to be just the general plan update. Excellent. Melinda? So oh, I'm thinking since we're on this topic of future topics for meetings, um, perhaps in April or in May, um, I, I have been reading that there's some new legislation potentially coming from the state around fire safe landscaping. Um, I do know we've got some folks um, who, Marilyn Sarney, who often attends this meeting, has been trained in that and she's a master gardener, but I'm wondering what the governmental agencies are that potentially could talk to us about that. Because if we wait too late on fire season, it's too hard to change your landscaping if you wait till July. Yeah. So if we could fold that into an April or May meeting um, so that people could start to think about 
getting ready for the next fire season since, I mean, we've had some rain, but we haven't had enough. And I think we all have to assume it's going to be awful again. So, um, Melinda, so I have some clarification specifically about people maintaining. Are we talking about like a, uh, what do they call it? The perimeter defensible? Well, space? this isn't just defensible perimeter. There's, there's um, new stake stuff coming down around the kinds of plants, for example. Um, I know Marilyn talked about on Facebook, she showed this juniper bush that from the outside looks just fine, but inside it's like a bomb. And if you've got one of those next to your house, that's like having a Roman candle next to your house. And so, you know, her recommendation was, you know, you should get rid of your juniper if it's anywhere near your house. I mean, and it's, so it's not just the defensible perimeter. It's also choosing plants, um, especially really near your house that are fire safe, but even choosing them, you know, we, we've all been doing like California natives and drought tolerant. Well, now there's this whole category of fire safe. Um, and so I don't know if there's somebody in the county who will be implementing any regulations coming from the state, I don't even know how that happens, but I'm assuming it's the fire protection protection district where they were going to start encouraging people to take out certain plants. I mean, we all know, for example, that um, eucalyptus trees are just dangerous as all get out. A whole bunch of them were taken down on hill, taken down on hillside because they were dangerous. Um, there's a lot of, anyway, I'm just, we can talk more about that, but maybe in the April or May meeting, having a presentation on fire safe landscaping, and especially if there's any regulations coming down from the state, because I think there are some regulations coming where people are going to be. The May agenda would be a good place for it, because uh, the next yeah. March and April are going to be, March is the 2040, April is the health update, May agenda, let's put it there. Yeah, and it's going to be new code. So, I mean, yeah, at some point, we'll discuss, the, we'll discuss it on the, on the May agenda. Yeah, put it in there. And I'll, I'll check with our fire technician who's come to our meeting, and, and her name is completely escaping my mind, and I've known her for a decade. I can't think of her name. but I it'll, was, it'll come to you when you're in your office, and, and it's not now. You, you know, <laughs> no, that's a great I'm home tonight. Thank, thank you, Melinda. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, G. So, okay. if there, if there, are there any more comments on... Uh, proposed agenda items or speakers for upcoming meetings? Uh, Will, you have um, your hand up? Yeah, I thought the East Bay Med thing tonight was pretty interesting. And I'm all, it made me think, um, recently I was trying to figure out whether it's a good idea to get uh, solar for my house. And so I was delving into my PG&E bill and it's really incomprehensible. Uh, have you had PG&E present? And I'd love to hear them try to explain what they're up to in, in general, just like what we heard tonight. That's a great suggestion. I mean, I look yeah. at my bill and I feel like I'm trying to decipher something from an Egyptian yeah. tomb. Yeah. You know, um, I would also highly recommend everybody switch to MCE. Well, well you're still you get a better bill. But you're still with PG&E. It's still a PG&E bill. And, well, and that really, adds another layer of complexity. It's if, really. If I may. If it's I actually may, better. If I may. And, it's greener um, and deeper. If I may, oh, George. Um, I would recommend against that because they're a private entity and they are, it would basically that meeting would devolve into a shouting match. And I don't think it's, it's because basically it would not a shouting match, but it would turn into something like everybody and their brother-in-law would air their grievances against PG&E. And I think, frankly, I think it's a waste of time. I've been present for one such meeting. Um, it, it, I'll, I'll talk with our with our rep. I'll talk with the contact we have for PG&E. We would need something specific. I, I, I think I, like something. I love the idea of something to explain the bill. Something to. Okay. I mean, I think that that's a really good first step. All right. And, um, and I would add, just as a part of the bill. I mean, this is part of why we really were glad to to switch to MCE. If you do have solar, the way PG&E deals with solar is so labyrinthine and so insane that it's impossible to understand MCE's calculations. And we've gotten more back. We have the same array 
and we have the same provider. PG&E is providing our power, but MCE, we get more money back every year because of the way they do the formulas, but it's very hard to understand. And so if we focused on billing and maybe specifically not just billing, but also for people who have solar, it's their calculations are inscrutable. Mm -hmm. And, and I can tell you, my wife worked at it really hard (laughs) and it's still, so if we could just focus on billing and, you know, have them send a customer service person out like George, George's counterpart at PG&E, then we won't have the high level fighting match. Then we'll maybe get to some information. We'd have people that'd be upset anyway. You know, that's, that, that's, oh, yeah, but, but at is, least we might get some useful information. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I don't doubt that we'd get some good information, but I do understand where George is coming from. PG yeah, yeah. is a very, I don't want to say, target, but I can't <laughs> think of another way. There's a lot of angst there, and sort of anxiety yeah. around people's interactions with PG E, with the wildfires and things like that. When those things happen, the calls come to every level of government. Friends at the city, oh, yeah. people call our office. They're mad because we all work for PG&E. You're in the county, you're in the city, you all work for PG&E, we're mad at everyone. So, <laughs> but, but, I, but I can help you know, manage some of that by muting people and things like that. So I'll well, make, and the, request, I'll make on, the request on your bill. So we can end our meeting tonight. I'll make, the request, bill. I'll make the request to PG&E and then in March, I'll let everybody know what I hear. Okay. okay. So um, I think we've had a really uh, substantive a uh, set of discussions today and great presentations by law enforcement, fire, and uh, Edmund. I really felt I learned a lot from the Edmund presentation. And uh, thank you, Harry, for your contribution yes, to the meeting. And I think, you know, uh, we can all say uh, goodbye until next month. Yes. All right. Be sure to email me any questions, concerns you guys got between now and then. Have a good night. All right. Thank you. Wonderful meeting, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.